All righty. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Um, Mike, are you there? Tyler, I am here. I am just joining. I got a little bit of a, a slow connection, but it should come on here pretty soon. Okay. Well, either way, we'll work through that. No worries at all. Hello, everybody. Welcome again. As you can tell, um, got a little bit more of a casual background today. Um, I hope everybody's having a good Friday. Um, let me know in chat where you're from, how old you are, and what swim team you're repping, all right? Um, while we're waiting on Mike's connection to settle. Hey, Cordelia Sims, if you continue to spam, I will ban you. Please do not spam. All right. Mike, you there? I can hear you. I'm just having a little bit of an issue with the video feed, but it yesterday this did this to me too with Zoom, so we should it should come a little bit clearer in a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, um, I guess at least we have audio, so we'll wait. We'll wait on the video for now. Um, sure. So, Mike, you know, you and I have known each other for a little while. Um, Talk to us a little bit about kind of your background as a coach and, you know, where you're coaching and, and where you're at right now, actually. Sure. So um, I have been a club coach since about 2006 um, and also been a, a college assistant at multiple levels in the sport. I've been coaching at Victor Swim Club for the better part of the last decade. I did take two years where I went down to Long Island to work with Islanders Aquatics. It was an unbelievably great experience. Um, and then Victor Swim Club just brought me back. Uh, so thrilled to be back. But uh, I have a lot of experience coaching both age group and senior level swimming uh, and national level swimming. So over the past 15 years, um, I've been seminally involved in coaching club. And so the, the real focus of my career the past 15 years has been coaching at the club level. My audio is off. Sorry. I was uh, I was responding to somebody about, you know, where my backdrop is. So kind of a funny thing about this whole situation while we've been under quarantine is that I've had to use my bathroom as a makeshift studio. <laughs> so um, every time before I get online, I have to completely convert my bathroom into being a studio. So now the bathroom is actually offline. I'm unable to use it. And I'm in my sort of living room slash office. You can actually, you can see my gold medal right here. And there's an interesting message right here. I'm actually getting married on Sunday. So yeah, um, that's gonna be great. We're not able to have our normal wedding or anything like that. We're only gonna have about five people together and we're going to be streaming our wedding to our close family and then hopefully we'll be able to have a larger wedding on um you know, on, in july so it's a little bit of background that's why i don't have my backdrop up right now oh we've got two mike murray's now thanks everybody um mike can you hear me not now i got you tyler okay well we still have just audio and, and no video for some reason weird but that's okay i mean let's um let's move forward i guess into the into the videos and um sure. we'll just kind of get into it and people can stare at my ugly mug and your awesome picture <laughs> <laughs> so which uh which video do you want to start out with here uh what i'd like to do is i think if we start down towards the bottom 
with 4065? That's correct. Yep. All right, let's pull this one up here. So Ready? folks, what we're gonna be doing here is just um, playing through some of these videos and, and we're gonna try to watch and learn what we can and Mike's gonna talk us through what's going on <clears throat> and I'll try to, um, I'll, I'll try to interject when and where I can. So here we go. So what we were doing here, Tyler, is we were working on trying to get Michaela's tempo up because traditionally she has struggled with tempo, especially in the back end of races. So here what we were doing was just working on trying to get that tempo up. And what we did was we changed her stroke from a traditional high elbow stroke into more of a free arm swinging freestyle. And you can kind of see this here. She does a great job with that left arm coming around. That right arm still had a little bit of bend in the elbow. But one of the things that we've really tried to work on in the last two years was getting her home better in the 200 and 400 IM, as well as getting back faster in the 800 and the mile. Mm -hmm. And I feel like over the, over the course of the last two years, this has been a game changer from, for her. Uh, Coach Mark Bernardino at NC State has done a wonderful job, and uh, Coach Troy at the University of Florida, when she was there, did a wonderful job at, at helping her realize this. This is this last summer when she was home and we were working on some specifics. But you can see here for Michaela, this tempo is actually a lot faster than what she's done before. So anything you see, Tyler, feel free to jump in here. Um, the biggest thing with Kay since this video has been shot has been getting a quicker breath in freestyle. She tends to ha kind of have that head out a little bit too long. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've really focused on trying to get a, a quicker breath, and that's something that Dino and the staff at NC State has really cleaned up. So anything you see here, feel free to jump in inside. Yeah, I mean, the, the two, you know, if I was to give this particular swimmer two things to really work on, it would be um, head position. Both of them actually are head position related. So let me see if I can pause. So pausing the video right there, you can see that she's actually doing a really good job at, you know, kind of trying to split her face in two with the water surface. But still, the water surface actually flows kind of like up and then down the side of your head. And instead of trying to sort of bury the front of her head a little bit and lift up her chin more, it looks to me like her head is a little bit more vertical than, than I personally might like. Right so I, I might talk to her about trying to feel like she's breathing with her chin being higher than her forehead. That's one. And then you can kind of catch it on the way back but it looks to me like she swims freestyle looking forward a little bit. And definitely right there when she picked her head up to breathe here, right there. Yeah, so you can see like, you can actually see really, really well here. Let me see if I can pull up a, a whiteboard and show everybody what I'm talking about. So you can see that because her head right here is pretty high, like the surface of the water is actually right here, you can tell that her hips are quite low. Can, every, can everybody see those lines in chat? I wanna know in chat if you can see those lines. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is that as soon as you pick up your head, and we've talked about this time and time again, it causes your hips to drop, and you can really see that here. And not only that, but you can also tell when she starts swimming. So let me clear this out. You can also see when she starts swimming that she kind of tends to keep her head up just a little bit. You can see that her eyes are actually pointed down this way instead of pointing straight down. And it might seem like a really, really, um, a really small difference, but it's really important, I think, especially for somebody who swims distance freestyle. And the way I might talk to her about this is, is say, imagine that you have a piece of rope that's tied to the back of your head here that's also attached to your tailbone right here. By bringing that rope forward a little bit more, it's going to pull your hips up just a little bit more. And that's what we want. Does everybody kind of understand that? I want to know in chat if, if that makes sense to everybody. Elizabeth Hall, if you continue to spam, I will ban you. And I know I've had to ban you several times before. So knock that off, please. 
Um, so anybody else, uh, anything else that, that you think about sort of what I said, Mike? Yeah, so I, I think all of those points are, are really, really right on. The one thing that I really enjoyed, and, and you mentioned this this summer when you and I were working together, is the idea of that rope, Tyler, and kind of keeping everything on that rope so that we have the best body, line, and posture. So I think maybe if you expand a little bit upon your, your idea of that, that rope, because it's something that you talk about in backstroke also. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and I can see the connection here when you're talking about it. But if you could elaborate a little bit more on that, I think it would be really good for people who are on the chat. Let me see if I can show everybody my video a little bit better. All right. So let's imagine that this USB cable is the rope that I'm talking about. Right on. Okay. So imagine that this rope is tied to the back of your head into your tailbone right here. Now you should be able to see that if my head is in proper position, there should be, a, it's a pretty straight rope, right? Everybody can see that, right? Yep. Now in, in freestyle, if I lift my head up, you should see that the rope is kind of loose right now. And because that's the case, it's gonna cause my hips to drop and sag in the water. So instead of swimming with your head up in freestyle, I actually want people to start thinking about pulling on this rope to try and bring your hips up to the surface by tucking your chin in and really trying to extend the head. So we're not trying to swim looking forward in freestyle because it's gonna cause our hips to sink by really extending that spine and tucking the chin in that will cause the hips to come up to the surface. I wanna know, Chad, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, so Tyler, what you did right there was I think you showed a really good head to hip alignment also inside of that rope analogy where when our, when our body is traveling through the water, if our body is traveling through and the entire thing is in line and we're maintaining our balance and posture there, we're going to be traveling in a much more efficient position hydraulically than we would be with that head up. So mm -hmm. that head hip relationship becomes so important because the second that that chin comes up and I'm out of line with my hips or I'm out of line of the rope, then I'm, I'm going to be in a position that's slowing me down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And, and, you know, I always talk about this idea of a torpedo, right? Like if you, if you were to push a torpedo through the water this way or try to push the torpedo through the water this way, which do you think is going to be faster? This way or this way? This That's way. That's exactly right. Right? So that head-hip relationship that you're talking about and the hydraulics of what you're talking about is if you have your head high and your hips low, you're just going to be plowing through the water like a barge. But if your head is in the right position, not too low, but if it's in the right position and your head allows your shoulders to make a hole that your hips and your ankles follow through the water, then you're just going to pierce through the water like a torpedo would, and that's exactly what you want. So right on. Um, let's go Let's go to um, another video. What else, uh, which other one do you wanna pull up, Mike? Oh, one thing that I think is great that we can jump to from here, Tyler, is if we go up to the, the WUGS video. Okay. We get to that 400 IM in the WUGS video and we look at the freestyle, I think you're gonna see a lot of the adjustments that she made from last, the beginning of last summer to the end of last summer when we were in Italy. From Napoli? Uh, from Napoli? Yes. Yep. Okay. So if we get to that video, video. and I, I, the, the 400 IM starts at the 550 mark. 550. Yep. And we can, you know, we can watch the, the start of the race to see other strokes. But if you want to get, if you want to fast forward to the freestyle, that's fine. She made a, a lot of good adjustments in the freestyle, and I think we'll see that here. Yep, so you just got to back that up. Okay, here we go. Yep, so here she is from breast into free. And you're going to see two big changes here, and Tyler talked about one of them. You're going to see that head position is a lot lower, Tyler, right out of the gate right way there. way better. Yeah, I noticed that immediately. So that was something that Mark Bernardino really worked on. And you're going to see here, too, you're going to see my fat self in the background there. 
But you're, <laughs> you're going to see her really doing a much better job on the quick breath. So as, And you'll see as she comes into this last wall, her tempo is like changed so much from what we were doing in, in the early part of the summer. And you can see that that tempo is a lot more live. And that mm -hmm. head position that you mentioned has really changed for the better. That's this shot right here is actually I, I think great. I want to I want to watch this again just a little bit because when you when you see her going back towards the wall, I want everybody to look at how much rotation she's getting with her shoulders. Let me try and blow myself up just a little bit more. Look at how much rotation she's getting from her shoulders. So she's not just swimming with her arms and her shoulders are and her upper body staying narrow. She's really opened up. And that's really helping her out, especially at the end of a four hundred IM when all of your muscles are screaming and they want to, uh, they basically want to shut down. <laughs> that rotation is basically the only thing that, that's going to keep you moving forward. So I hope everybody can see that. Um, who? So what's what's this swimmer's name, Mike? This is Michaela Sargent. And Michaela Sargent for those of, for those of you who are watching or uh, asking that question. So um, let us know in chat what you guys thought of her freestyle. I thought it was pretty dang good. Um, clearly, the the result was pretty solid, <laughs> but um, you know, the interesting thing that I I saw there was that you know it was very clear that instead of having a head up position when she was swimming, it was a lot more in line, and you could also see that her hips were higher too. That was really really good. Um, what do we want to go on to next, or do you want to watch, you know, more of the same race? Well, we, we can go to the <clears> – <throat> because we put all four strokes in our videos, <clears throat> I felt like we could go to that race anytime we need to to, to see the adjustments that she made cool. in less than, you know, three months. So that was – those videos that I shot were at the beginning of the summer, and then what you're seeing there is is the result at the end of the summer. So we can jump on, Tyler, I think, um, to 4110-1. Okay. Let's start this one up. So Ready? a little bit nope. on Michaela's background as an age grouper. When she was 11 years old, I, I, I knew that she had a natural feel for breaststroke. But as she got older, and this is true for a lot of uh, young women in the sport, and as the body changed, we had to change the breaststroke. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the, the breaststroke actually became one of our weak strokes in the IM. So we had to go back on it, Ready? and we kind of had to break it down all the way to the beginning. And one thing that we stressed at the beginning of the summer was just trying to find a little bit of a better line. Uh, she had a little bit of what I call a parabolic stroke. Mm -hmm. So the front part of her stroke, she was pressing down yep. and then coming back up. So it was a little bit of a loopy stroke. Mm -hmm. So what we had to do was spend a lot of time on trying to find that line. And, and maybe you can speak to that as you watch some of this. She, she doesn't have the most powerful kick. She's not the biggest athlete in the world. So we're not relying on strength. Technique Ready? and enduring nope. speed are her most deadly weapons. Well, one so, thing I want to point out is is her is her really great ankle flexibility. So already you can see it right there, where her her toes are nice and turned out. But everybody should be able to see that as she kind of she kind of dives in and then comes up and then dives in and then comes up. So down and then up. That's right. Down and then up. So. That's that's okay. That's definitely not bad. And, and I would say that in terms of, you know, trying to get the hips over the falls, so to speak, because it's really kind of like a porpoising motion. But in an ideal world, you know, if the water level is here, you would kind of come up and then just shoot straight down and forward. And there wouldn't be any of this sort of downward and, and back upward motion. Right. Um, if you look at some of the best breaststrokers in the world, um, especially with their kicks. Like I, I think Michael Lawrence has probably one of the greatest breaststrokes that I've ever seen. And she just has this amazing ability to just like lock her ankles in on the water and just shoots herself straight forward at a downward angle 
and then doesn't go any deeper than she absolutely needs to. And if you watch this video again, it looks like Michaela is going down just a little bit parabolically the way you described it. And then she kind of floats back up to the surface. The only other thing that I would say that she needs to work on is that as she, um, as she glides forward, you can see that there's a little bit of space in between her elbows and her head. And that just allows water to kind of pile up and, and kind of slow you down right here. One thing I worked on a lot in the latter part of my career in breaststroke was just as I rotate or as I stretch forward was to try to squeeze my elbows into the sides of my head to make myself slightly more hydrodynamic. And that really helped with my glide. So let's watch that one more time and see Three. if we can notice nope. how she kind of does that upward and downward motion and how she kind of relaxes her elbows instead of trying to really squeeze them together. You're a hundred percent right, Tyler. And one of the changes that we made uh, leading up to this video was uh, Coach Mark Hesse actually uh, was working with us, and he had mentioned that what Michaela needed to do for her breaststroke was to recover the heels faster. Mm -hmm. And and one thing that she does a great job in this video is you can see those heels recover right to the hips on every stroke cycle. The faster that we can get our age groupers, our developmental swimmers, and our, our intermediate range swimmers, the more we can teach Three, them to get those no. heels up, and like you said with Micah, position those feet to be as propulsive as possible is so important. So watch how quickly the feet snap up to the heel, or snap up to the hips. That's trying exactly to get your right. ankles as close to your butt as possible. Turn the ankles out and push backwards with the insides of your feet and your ankles and then snap the feet together. That's exactly right. So do we want to go back to the 4IM video and watch the breaststroke? We can. You're going to see – You're gonna, what, what I really was impressed with um, in this 400 IM in Italy uh, this past summer was on the breaststroke, you can really tell the DPS that she's getting. Uh, DPS means stroke. distance per stroke, everybody. Correct. So she's really trying to lengthen out the amount of distance she's getting, especially on her glide. And this is and, her. Correct. And for me, this was our most important leg because up there we have world class Alaria Cusinato. She went the third fastest time in the world last year going into this event. And you have Evie Pfeiffer up there who is a world class backstroker. So to me, I, and I told Michaela before the race, and I know Braden and, and Dino had talked to her, okay, just be even at, at, at the end of the 200 and let that breaststroke work for you. And you're going to see here, Tyler, and, and I would love to see your comments here. We're talking about an athlete who, who's not very tall, um, and you can see the distance per stroke she's getting here. And not just the distance per stroke, but you can see, Tyler, you had mentioned something about that hydrodynamic position out front and she did a really good job in the final here of riding that glide mm -hmm. yeah I, it's, I can definitely tell and you can actually see really clearly in this shot the person that's uh in the background is clearly a lot larger <laughs> than she is <laughs> but um you know that's not that's not always such a good thing so people talk you know people ask me constantly about um about you know their size in swimming and if you think about it, like in certain events, sure, being larger might be a helpful thing. But in the 400 IM, having to move a big body through the water in all four strokes isn't always that good of a thing. So sometimes the better 400 IMers might be a little bit smaller. De uh, Deas, uh, Deas Seto, he's a... Um, Seto, yeah. He's, yeah, he's a Japanese 400 IMer. He's not the biggest dude in the world. And he's amazing at the 400 IM. Um, yep. You know, Chase Kalish is relatively tall, but he's not that super muscular, you know, like you don't need to be the biggest to move through the water quickly. You just have to be the most hydrodynamically efficient. And you can tell uh, here that she's done a good job at getting away from that sort of parabolic stroke where she sort of dives under the water and then comes back up. And it also right. looks to me like she's doing a better job squeezing her elbows here to get her body to pierce through the water just a little bit better. That's 100% Very good. right. And I, and I think that, that uh, you know, at, at NC State, they did a really good job of reinforcing accelerating forward, Tyler, in the breaststroke instead of accelerating downward. And that's mm -hmm. a huge mistake that I see in age group swimming. But you can see here that acceleration forward in the breaststroke. Very good. Very good. That's awesome. 
Um, and you know, you can tell that that was, that was definitely being worked on. So it's actually really cool that, to see some of the video from, uh, you know, this, you said this was three months. Some of the video was shot three months before the, the race video. About three and a half, four months before the race. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to stop for a second to talk about something in chat. Let me know if this makes sense to you as I'm kind of talking through it. So the way our brains work is a lot like a computer. We, we program computers to do certain things, right? When you write a computer program, you're telling the computer what it is that you want to do. When we train a certain way, it's like we're programming our own brain. So the blessing and the curse of that is that when you train over and over and over again, it's like you have that program that's sort of etched into your memory. And one of the benefits about everybody being out of the water right now is that we kind of get to reset, so to speak. So it's like you're erasing all of the memory that you had of, you know, maybe some bad habits previously, and now you get to write new memory. And what we just saw was somebody who worked at something for three months, and we have, we have a, a marker of where she was at three months before the competition, and we see how she swam in competition. So it's clearly very easy, or not very easy, it's clearly possible to make some you know, I think very large changes in the course of three months, right? Yeah, exactly, Brandon. Absolutely. It's kind of like hit, this, this period is kind of like hitting a factory reset on you. So um, somebody, somebody said that uh, Ricardo Prado is a 1984 silver medal and record holder, and he was only five foot six. So that, that goes to show you, you don't have to be the tallest person in the world. Being tall doesn't necessarily hurt you. It's it's certainly helpful in a lot of ways, but you don't have to be tall in order to be fast. But what I was getting at is what you need to be doing when we get back into the water, and even you can do this now just by visualizing some of the things that we're talking about, is reprogramming your brain to train the way you want to race, right? Because obviously we're not going to go right back into racing. But what I want you guys to be thinking about, especially with all of these videos that we've been putting out for you guys, is that you need to be watching a lot of what we've been doing again, or a lot of what we've been showing you again. And I want you to lay down and I want you to visualize what it is we're talking about. I want you, even if you're not necessarily moving, I want you to visualize your own body moving the way that we're talking about moving and doing the things that we're talking about doing. I promise you it's gonna have a profound effect when we get back into the water. Um, and you can tell that this particular swimmer has done a good job at, at employing those, those skills of, of looking at what she was doing, visualizing what she needed to do and executing what she needed to do with practice. And clearly she was able to execute what we wanted her to in that meet because we have video evidence. So that being said, uh, Mike, which video do you wanna to go to next? We can go to uh, 4094 and now we have world-class backstroker Tyler Clary to really break some things down. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think we started here, Tyler, with maybe a little bit of Ready? spin drill. And, okay. and we are not working with a white twitch muscle fiber athlete here. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are working with uh, red twitch, uh, really more of an enduring Ready? speed, Go. starts to hold water as, as she's swimming. So that's a quick clip, and I know we, we get into more of a, a, a backstroke stroke as we progress through these videos. No, but that, this is actually a great point to, to talk yeah. about. So watch sure. how as she starts here, her head's really high, and you can see her hips are low. And then as she starts to drop her head, her hips come right up to the surface. So a lot of times, you see that? So a lot of the time, um, let me back it up just a little bit. Hold on just a moment. Sometimes our, our platform can be a little bit wonky. Bear with me, everybody. No problem. So Ready? let's get to right here and then pause. Move forward just a little bit. The bar's in the way, but you can see this really well here. Her head is really high. Let me move myself out of the way. Her head is really high and her hips are really low, right? Yep. And unfortunately, a lot of swimmers swim backstroke that way where they're kind of looking down at their toes. And it basically just means that they're going to drag their butt on the bottom of the water or on the bottom of the pool. But you notice that as she started to lean her head back, like the exact opposite of freestyle, 
when you have your head up like this, your hips drop. In backstroke, where you have your head looking down at your feet, your hips tend to drop. So you can see that really, really well in that video. But one thing I was noticing that she's doing well is that as she's entering the water way up here, she's getting her hand on the water very, very quickly. So a lot of swimmers will just kind of put their hand in and then kind of sweep out to the side and then they'll get on the water all the way down here. So if you think about your pull in terms of, you know, from the top to the bottom of your pull, I want to pull from as high as I can get to as low as I can get. And a lot of swimmers completely waste a lot of the time up here above their head by sweeping their hand out and then starting their pull way down here. When you can actually get your hand on the water and start pulling way up above your head. And it's the swimmers that figure this out that are going to end up being really, really good in backstroke. And you can tell in her stroke that she's doing that really, really well. So I want to watch the video again, see if there's anything um, else I could pick out. Actually, is uh, is forty ninety three? I think Tyler, if we go up there, uh, I think forty ninety four might yeah, be full stroke backstroke. Let's just see what this one is. Go. Oh, this is two 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 drill. Yeah. Yeah, I had two two kicks on her front, two kicks on her side, and then kick out to the back. 4094, you said is full backstroke? Or 4093. Yeah. Either either of those. the drill. Okay. Ready? So, so this should be full backstroke. We're gonna watch what she's doing here. And this drill right here, Tyler, if I can pause you for a second. That drill right there came from Michaela playing around with uh you, Ryan Lochte, uh a couple other people at Mesa the night before the Grand Prix. You guys were there. David was there. Kay was finishing eight 400s. And David Marsh was, was talking smack to me about the main set and said, oh, yeah, if anybody's done anything like that, it's Tyler. And you guys actually were doing 2-2 two -two drill. You were going off the slide. I don't know if you remember this, the slide in the back pool at Mesa at, at the end of a night session. So yeah. you guys had the end of the practice, and Kay's like, Coach Mike, they're pros. They're going down the slide, and I got to finish these. And David said to you, well, you know, if anybody's done any work like this, it's Tyler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, so if anybody here in chat has ever been to Mesa Aquatic Center out in Mesa, Arizona, uh, shout out to you guys. But what's kind of fun about this pool is it's outdoors, and it's um, it's got like – a small water park type of thing in another, in another pool. So it was always kind of a fun thing for us to go and just kind of horse around and try to launch ourselves off of the, the big water slide into the water and try to do different things with our streamline. And that's kind of one of the, something that I found to be true amongst a lot of the best swimmers out there is that they, they have a lot of fun and they play around in the water a lot. Like it's not just a constant, don't get me wrong, there is a lot of grinding, a lot of hard work, but you also have to find a way to sort of play around and, and learn new things in the water by doing weird stuff. And it might be going down a water slide head first into, uh, into the water and, and trying to see how long you can glide or going down and, and in, into the water the same way and trying to you know do the two, two, two drill. And the thought was with the two, two, two drill is that you do two kicks on your front, two kicks on your side, and then two kicks on your back. And the thought is, is that by being able to do that really accurately and making sure that you're flat on your side or flat on your stomach, uh, all the way on your side and then all the way on your back, you have really good control of the kick with your core and it's a really good engagement drill. Um, why, why would you teach somebody to do the two, two, two drill, Mike? Uh, I'm sorry, Tyler, say that again. Why would you teach someone? What would be the point in you teaching someone the two, two, two drill? So two things. Number one, I think if we're telling the athletes to get six kicks in a different way than just pushing off on your back and going six kicks or pushing off on your front, they're going to be a lot more aware of making sure that two are on our front, two are on our side, two are on our back, 
or if we're going into backstroke, two are on our front, two are on our side, two are on our back. We are much more likely as coaches to engage the athletes if we're asking them to specifically focus on two kicks on each side. A lot of times I find that coaches say, this set is all four to six kicks off every wall. You're going to get that for a 50. Then it's going to break down. But if we say we're going two, two, two in this warm up off every wall, then you're going to see them be aware and cognizant of the fact that when I push off this wall, I have to do two on every side. So for me, it's just a way to reinforce making sure that number one, we're working on our distance underwater. And then we're also working on our abs, our core, our legs, and building in, as Coach Troy says from the University of Florida for many years, repetition of correct. We are trying to build in repetition of correct all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that and that's such a that's such a great point because this uh, I hear this phrase all the time. You know, practice makes perfect, and that's so ridiculously wrong. And I want to take people when they say that and just shake them, be like, "No, that's right. <laughs> it's, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. Correct. Only perfect practice makes perfect. Correct. And the only way that you can make perfect permanent is by practicing perfectly all the time. And that's that's you know, pra you know that that uh, repetition of correct. That's just another way of saying practice perfectly or practice as perfectly as you can. So um, that's such a great point. But um, and it kind of all boils into the same sort of uh, muscle memory thing that we were both talking about earlier. You know, if if you do something a certain way for a certain period of time, then eventually that's just going to be autopilot. When you get to the end of a race, you're going to swim that exact same way that you've trained. But and, and actually conversely to that, if you expect that you're going to train a certain way and then you want to go to a meet and you expect that you're going to swim and perform differently than the way you've trained, that's completely illogical and it doesn't even make sense. So I wish people would look at practice as like a race rehearsal for their meet. And if you approach every one of those practices like a race rehearsal for a meet, you're going to be amazed at how easy it is to just, you know, just go through on autopilot, let your body do what you've trained it to do for so long. And then you can actually use your conscious mind to focus on the race at hand, if, if that makes sense at all. Um, I'm seeing some questions about uh, replay links, you guys. Um, You'll actually get an email here in a couple of hours with a link to the replay of this video. So I appreciate the question, but you'll get that email in a couple of hours. So you will get this replay. Um, let's move forward a little bit. So we, we've, I don't think we found, what's this 4070? You remember what 4070 is? I'm gonna, I'm trying to scroll up here. Uh, let's see what it is, open it up. I'm not 100% I'm not sure off the top of my head. But to your point, Tyler, I, I was very fortunate to work for a great coach two, two, uh, two, named and Larry Van Wagner at Marist two, College. Go. And he used to say, Mike, water density doesn't change no matter where we're racing, no matter where we train. Uh, and it's so true. The thing that changes is the application of your technique and the proprioception that, that, that you take into each training session or into each race. So every single stroke in practice it doesn't matter what stroke it is fly back breast free or underwater kicking it has to be done with intent mm -hmm. and you have to be conscious of that intent and what's mm -hmm. his contention was what separates good from great is conscientious intent in everything that you're doing mm -hmm. yeah it's so true it's very 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 true um so I actually, Mike, I want to look at, um, I'd actually like to go through the whole 400 IM video. Let's do it. And and I want to challenge everybody here to, to watch this. And then I want I want you to try and sit down for a couple of minutes after this, after our webinar is over. We're getting close to the end here. And I want you to try and visualize yourself doing the same race without even moving, okay? And I want, I want to see if that's helpful for you, because, uh, you know, I got a question from uh, Joshua Tom over here that's asking about drills that, that we can perform outside the pool. Obviously, there's nothing that you can do 
that's going to completely replace getting in the pool. And it's kind of a sad fact, but there's nothing you can do that's going to completely replace that. But there's a lot you can do to train your mind once we get back open and we actually get back in the pool. And, and uh, Chad, I want to know if you've ever heard this statement before. Have you ever heard that that um, athletics is 10% physical, 90% mental? I want to know if you guys have heard that because I've heard that so much. And it's so it's kind of funny because as swimmers, we all like almost – all the time, we just focus on that 10% physical. And there's so little time that we actually devote to the 90% mental. So why don't we try to work on that now? Why don't we try to train our minds while we're completely unable to work on the 10% physical? Yeah, everybody's heard that statement, right? We should really be working on this stuff. So let's watch the race. Uh, Mike and I are going to talk through it a little bit. And, you know, I may point some stuff out that she's doing well or, you know, maybe that she could work on a little bit. But I want you guys to go back to this video or at least try to record as much in your brain as you can. I want you to imagine either swimming the same 400 I am or your best event. And I want you to visualize that four or five times. And I want you to think to yourself after you visualize those four or five times, what about my visualization was good? What about my visualization could have been better? And I want you to visualize again, making some of those improvements or maybe break down your, your, your catch or something like that. But there's a million different ways that you can break down in your mind what it is you're doing. And I promise it's going to have an effect when we get back in the water. So let's pull up um, her competition video again. And, and Tyler, you bring up some great points about visualization because for us, this uh, was – you know, a lifetime dream, a lifetime goal to, and and you can speak to this better than anybody, but for Michaela to have that black finals cap with the American flag on it, that, that was a lifetime goal that, uh, you know, we had talked about and really prepared for, for a lifetime. And Tyler, we did that in the face of a lot of people saying we couldn't do it. And, uh, yeah. That was a huge motivating factor. And going into this meet, we were the 12th seed going in to prelims. Um, and so for her to have a great morning prelim swim and then to have this finals, which I'll, I'll talk about after the race too, was pretty remarkable. But one thing that we've always had to do, and, and you can speak to this because you're an NCAA champion in the 400 IM, is how do we manage this butterfly? Because traditionally from the time that we were 10 or 11 years old, we just wanted to attack. And you can see Alaria went out really, really fast. Mm -hmm. And we knew that was gonna happen. So for Kay, the whole uh, idea behind this first 200 was just managing our energy level and making sure that if we kept it close and got to the back half, we were gonna be all right. Yeah. So. Um, one of the things I noticed about her butterfly is that it was very, very flowy and she was using her head to kind of drive the rest of her body. And she wasn't using a whole lot of legs, which I think is ex extremely important in a 400 IM. Um, and just kind of like a little tidbit, um, when you're on an international team, for, with the U.S. at least, and I'm sure a lot of the countries do it differently, you typically wear a white cap for your prelim swims. And then if you make semifinals or finals, then you put on the black cap. So with the U.S. team, there's always this kind of like mysticism that surrounded having that black cap. So I totally connect with what Mike was saying just now about you know, finally getting to, to put on that black cap. So the, uh, the thing, my ugly mug's in the way of her backstroke right now. <laughs> But you can tell, so you can see that she's rotating pretty well. Her head position looks maybe a tad high, but yep. clearly that's not working against her too terribly much. Um, you actually could see just a little bit of a difference between the girl up in lane six versus her turn. Um, you know, Michaela did kind of just that normal open turn, and the girl in lane six did like a weird head up spin turn and actually gained some ground on her there. So, but, Tyler, we give Michaela and, and Mark at NC State, give, we tell Michaela that once she learns a big girl turn, she'll be a pretty good 400 IM. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. But, hey, I mean, clearly it worked out for her here. So, 
a lot of people ask me about that turn and be like, well, you know, should I be, should I be trying to train this turn right away? And it's like, yeah, but like you may be giving up a half a second max. And that's if like, you know, somebody is really good at a head up spin or a crossover turn and you're really not that great at your turn at all. So we're really talking about just a couple of tenths of a second, but overall, you know, if you have, if you're trying to be like the whole package or the real deal in a 400 IM, yeah, you should have one of those more advanced turns. So she's doing a really good job here at, um, you know, not diving under the water too much. I find it interesting. Her her hands actually seem to to drive down when she's when she's recovering, and I don't know if that's a factor of her being tired at the at the start of a four hundred IM or at the so end of four hundred IM or not. That has been something that we've really worked on. And and full disclosure, as as I mentioned to you, her first real stroke that we saw success at when she was ten and eleven years old um, was breaststroke. Mm -hmm. So, so making sure that those hands didn't dive down, that's kind of always been been an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, her first Olympic trial qualifying time was a 200 breast. So we knew that oh, that wow. stroke was there. But if we're going to be world class in the 400 IM, we've got to tighten things up. So this video, actually, she's made a big improvement there. But you can still see, as you mentioned, she's diving down a little bit out front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only th and and what um, John Urbanchek used to always tell me that kind of really resonated with me was to imagine that I, my hands were kind of skating over the top of a glass table, and then only when I got to a point where my head was in between my arms could I finally fall off the table and sweep outwards. Right on. That that's a great way to look at it, and and for Michaela, one of the big things is. Once we, we, we call it slide to the Y and anchor. Mm -hmm. So it, it's one of our drills. And anybody who's on this tonight, um, and Tyler, you can, we'll put out my contact info. We have drills in this same pool where we've been watching some of the videos of Michaela swim. I have drills where we're working on that specific thing in both butterfly and breaststroke where our hands slide to the Y and anchor. Um, uh, Mike, do you want me to put your, your email in the chat? Absolutely. Totally fine. Okay. Um, Chad, I'm going to put Coach Mike's email in here. And if you have any questions for him, please feel free to reach out. He clearly does not seem to be scared by all you weirdos. Uh, <laughs> but I actually have an interesting question here for you before, um, before we finish up. What do you think would be some good drills or things to do and maybe you just echo what I've been saying about visualization, but what can people be doing right now while they're out of the water to continue improving? So today, Tyler, I was on a conference call with Mark Schubert and Greg Troy. Mm -hmm. um, old school coaches for sure. Yep. But two coaches who have always been very involved in maintaining the aerobic base. One of the things that I mentioned to you earlier was I, I had a great mentor as a young coach in Larry Van Wagner at Marist College. And he used to say to me all the time, Mike, there's no substitute for an aerobic base. And in a situation like this, where everybody's scrambling to do dry land, I have found that what I have seen online is that most people have been primarily concerned with strength. Instead of their aerobic base. Instead of maintaining a really healthy cardio respiratory workout. Not a lot of people, Tyler, myself included, love to run. Oh, I hate running. But running, biking, rowing, or the VASA trainer, I think our key ingredients at this point in time in maintaining your level of fitness to be ready. And as the fitter and faster swim tour has mentioned several times and in several different webinars, there's going to be a point in time where we're back in the pool. What does that look like? We don't know, but it's going to look a lot better if we are physically fit from a cardio standpoint. Mm -hmm. Totally. So, you know, biking, um, jump roping, 
doing long sets of jumping jacks, running, obviously, um, hiking, anything, anything that you could do for an extended period of time that's going to get your heart rate up, totally agree, is going to help out your aerobic base. And another point that I want to make that I'm sure you guys covered in your call is that, you know, again, this whole thing is finite. We are eventually, at some point, we're going to be able to get back in the water. But I think it's really important for everybody that's here to keep in mind that you really need to have a plan for how you're going to get back to competitive shape. So I know that there are going to be some swimmers out there and I know that there are going to be some coaches out there that are going to say, oh, we're going to get right back into this whole um, this whole you know, six practices a week or more, you know, several thousand yards or meters for every practice. And it's just, it's not going to work that way. And it's honestly, it's probably going to result in a lot of injuries if people do, if people do that. So have a plan for how you're going to build up, have a plan for how you're going to, um, you know, take care of your body while you're, you know, going through this ramping up process. Mike, do you have anything to say about that? No, I, I, I think that's especially true, Tyler. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that that all of the athletes are concerned about right now is I have never taken this much time off. I don't know what it's going to be like when I get back to the pool. Hmm. And I look at that in two ways. The, the first way I look at it is, okay, understand where you are in your swimming career and evaluate where you want to be and don't allow this to be the defining moment of who you are or who you become. The second thing that I look at it for, for a lot of us, this is actually a break for us to value and really appreciate how important this sport is to all of us. So if we're not using this time to appreciate how much we miss swimming, or if we're not using this time to say, I am totally committed to my goals moving forward, then I think we're misusing this time. None of us plan for this. This is all unscheduled time that we have. So my message to my team and my message to other people has been, look, I've really been able to value a lot of things uh, that this break has afforded me more time with my family, more time to connect to my children, more time to connect with my staff, more time to connect with my team on a one-to-one -one personal level. And so how are we using this time effectively to become better people? Not just better swimmers, but better people. Yeah. And that's, it's a really, really good point. Cause you know, I'm sure that there are, there were, this would probably be a time of year where people would be in the middle of a training phase and wondering whether or not they still wanted to do this. So having a period of time where it's like, when we get back into this thing, I am bought in 100%, no questions asked. I'm going to buy into the program, trust that my coach knows what he's doing, and I'm just going to get after it. And I think a lot of people are going to be surprised at how they end up at the end of the year. By the way, uh, we were talking about staying in shape. Um, out of the water. I'm very proud of my fiance slash future wife because she was over here doing um, some leg lifts and uh, some V up. So everybody <laughs> should be doing that stuff. Um, anyway, so I think we're going to cut it here, y'all. It was uh, about an hour. Thank you so much for watching. Um, Speedo, thank you for all your technique videos. To be honest, the Speedo videos are confusing. Awesome. I'm happy that you like our videos a little bit better. But thank you everybody very much for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, we've got more webinars coming next week. Those should come out, uh, if not today, sometime tomorrow. And um, we're also going to be launching a couple other things that I think you guys will find interesting. Taylin, uh, there were some winners yesterday. We're actually gonna be uh, putting up a social media post in the next few days about who won. Um, everybody have a great rest of your Friday. Uh, Mike, do you have any final messages for everybody before we end, end the room? No, Tyler, so thankful that I get to, to hang out with you and talk swimming. And, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's a dream come true to be able to share these kinds of things with a wider audience. And, 
Uh, I feel especially lucky to be involved with Fitter and Faster. So I appreciate all of you guys and everything that you've done during this shutdown. We have been putting out every Fitter and Faster clinic to our membership. And I know that our athletes, many of whom are signed on right now because I checked the attendees, uh, they have been so appreciative of the content that uh, the company has been putting out. So a big thank you to you. A big thank you to David Arluck and fitter and faster we appreciate you guys well it's it's awesome to be a part of a great team and um to have it's you know we're really thankful to have you here you know you do so much to stay engaged in the community and this is just i feel like a, another thing that's um adding to your your credibility and just generally being a great guy so thanks everybody for being here like i said have a great rest of your friday have a great weekend um, we have actually a Saturday webinar that's going to be tomorrow at one o'clock Eastern. Check that out if you like. Other than that, stay safe, stay positive and wash your dang hands. Bye. Thanks, Tyler.